The patient treated in this case today is a 57-year-old African-American female who had worn a conventional maxillary complete denture, opposing an, an old IMZ implant retained overdenture for the past 14 years. She was very satisfied with her implant prosthesis. However, she was still wearing a maxillary complete denture, and even though aesthetically it was acceptable to her, she was concerned about long-term bone loss and the fit of the denture. She also would like to have the palate removed in her denture if that was possible. Figure 1 demonstrates the high smile line of this patient, and as you can see, the complete maxillary denture certainly is aesthetically pleasing. In figure two, we show the preoperative panoramic radiograph, which appears to illustrate good height of bone to accept dental implants in the premaxillary area. So using this and our clinical evaluation of the ridge, as shown in figure three, it appears that we have plenty of bone to be able to place four implants with maybe a locator, single locator attached overdenture, or maybe a bar retained overdenture. Certainly, there's other diagnostic um, tests or other tools we could use to place our implants. Uh, it looks like we have plenty of bone, so maybe we could put more implants in and give her even a fixed prosthesis if that was possible. Figure four shows the vertical height of bone. Again, Look, it looks like we have very adequate amount of bone to work with. Figure 5 shows the underside of her properly fabricated, well-fitting conventional maxillary denture. And this denture is going to be used or duplicated to fabricate the CT guide and eventual surgical guide. So we simply duplicate this denture. The laboratory will then use gutta percha markers and we will take a CT scan using a very stable, clear acrylic CT guide. Figure 7 shows the CT digital plan, and this illustrates the panoramic cross-sectional and axial views, as well as three-dimensional rendering of the patient's maxilla. Simple panoramic radiographs or periapicals do not give the three-dimensional image achieved with this CT scan. I thought this case was a slam dunk. It looked like we had plenty of bone to work with on the panoramic. However, as we can see in figure 7, the bone is extremely thin in the premaxilla. I was completely fooled by the, our conventional radiographs. We had good height of bone, but terrible width of bone. So the difference between a th three-dimensional diagnosis, as we see here in figure seven, versus a two-dimensional diagnosis, even though we did a clinical evaluation and it appeared that we have adequate bone, our decision to place implants in the premaxilla using our conventional techniques would have been wrong we would not have been able to place implants predictably without grafting the area. Our CT scanning here allows us to make pre-surgical decisions on whether or not we can place implants in a different part of the maxilla. And that's what we'll end up doing. From the CT scan and diagnosing that we made, a surgical guide is fabricated. This surgical guide is a universal surgical surgic guide made from uh, made by Materialize. It consists of single surgical guide keys based on the drill diameters that we're going to use. And again, the size of implants that we're going to place are all predetermined using the CT scanning software. Sleeves are placed in the surgical guide to give us direction of each of the drills. Figure 8 demonstrates this universal surgery guide from Materialize. The surgery guide, 
as seen in figure 9, is placed onto the maxilla and locked into place using stabilizing pins. This surgical guide does not move once the stabilizing pins are placed, allowing for a very accurate guided placement of the dental implants. So in this situation, the CT diagnosing was critical to, to our attempt in placing our implants. Figure 10 demonstrates the surgical stent in place with a narrow platform guide used for the 2.0 millimeter Lindemann drill guiding angulation and depth. The Cybron implant system, which we chose to use in this case, is very simple and precise. The first drill used to initially determine angulation is that Lindemann guide drill. This is a very sharp drill with a very sharp point. The Lindemann drill is positioned to the predetermined depth that was determined using the CT diagnosing and the Simplant software, which allows us to virtually place the implants before we ever touch the patient. So this Lindemann drill is positioned to the predetermined depth through the two millimeter platform key guide. The next two figures here show a 2.2 millimeter platform key positioned into the, into the sleeve and the 2.2 diameter twist drill is then used to establish depth. As you can see in this system, the black lines are clearly delineated. Seven millimeters, 9 millimeters, 11 millimeters, 13 millimeters, and 15 millimeters to the top of the twist drill. Soft tissue is compensated for with the CT and the universal surgical guide. Figure 15 illustrates a periapical radiograph of the 2.2 millimeter twist drill to the predetermined depth. It's always nice to take a radiograph to know exactly where you are at any one time. Next, we put a 2.8 millimeter platform key into the guide and a 3.3 millimeter twist drill is used to the proper depth. The actual diameter of this 3.3 millimeter twist drill, however, is 2.8 millimeters. Figure 18 shows we went to proper depth. Figure 19 shows a periapical radiograph of this 3.3 millimeter twist drill in the correct position. Now, figure 20 is showing our osteotomy for the posterior implant. So here we're doing the posterior implant drilling with a 2.2 millimeter platform key in position. The next slide shows the 2.8 millimeter platform key in position. And this is for a 3.3 millimeter implant. Now remember, again, we're undersizing the osteotomy to accept a bigger implant to create initial stability. Figure 22 shows the 3.5 millimeter platform key in position. And here a 4.1 millimeter twist drill is used. The actual diameter of this 4.1 millimeter twist drill in the Cybron system is 3.5 millimeters. That may be a little confusing, but again, we're undersizing the osteotomy to accept a wider diameter implant. Figure 23 shows a 4.2 millimeter platform key in position, and a 4.8 millimeter twist drill is used, whose actual diameter is 4.2 millimeters. Now, once all the osteotomies are made, because we used a universal surgery guide system, I can't place the implants through that surgical guide. So I simply remove the surgical guide, and here I'm using a tissue punch to remove the epithelium around the neck of the osteotomy sites. We don't want epithelium to be engaged within the osteotomy site, because it can cause a problem in healing. So I'm simply using a tissue punch and remo remo removing it. Figure 25 shows us 
replacing a 3.3 millimeter by 13 millimeter Cybron Pro XRT dental implant in position. So we're threading this implant into position of tooth number five. This was all predetermined using our CT diagnosis and our virtual placement of the implant using the Simplant system. Figure 26 shows the 4.8 by 9 millimeter Cybron Pro XRT dental implant being threaded into the number three tooth position. The next slide shows the four implants placed in the posterior maxilla. You can clearly see this was a flapless procedure, precisely directionally placed using CT scanning software and a universal surgical guide that allows us, allowed us to make our osteotomy in a precise position. The next two periapicals show the implants in ideal position. We were able to put the correct size and shape of implant for the individual situations. And remember, our panoramic was very deceiving early on. It looked like we had plenty of bone to work with. But our diagnosing using the scanning software, virtual placement of the implants, showed us what size, length, and width of implant we could predictably use and we did this in three dimensions, not two dimensions. The final CT scan was taken after the implants were placed. And I want you to note the precise positioning of the implants as compared to the virtual placement that we used using the CT scanning software. We are right on. This is exciting technology and makes us much more precise in our surgical applications. Now, this patient does not experience post-operative pain of any, to any degree. It was a flapless procedure, relatively bloodless procedure. Patients do not experience a lot of discomfort. Now, I buried these implants, and we took her existing conventional denture, and I relined it with a soft lining material that she would wear during the healing process. We will allow approximately five months for integration to progress, followed by conventional impression techniques and fabrication of an implant-retained bilateral bar implant overdenture.